That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Hi, this is Ed Driscoll. Welcome to Silicon Graffiti. The 1960s began with a presidential election between conservative Cold Warrior Richard Nixon and the surprisingly conservative Cold Warrior John F. Kennedy. In terms of the similarity between the two candidates and the public that they represented, this was a high point in American unity. The assassination of John F. Kennedy began a process that ultimately shattered that unity. During the course of the 1960s, Americans witnessed the split between the earlier liberalism of FDR, Harry Truman, JFK, and LBJ, and the rise of the radical new left that emerged in the wake of President Kennedy's assassination. The alpha and the omega of those two forms of American liberalism came less than a month apart in the summer of 1969. On July 20th of 1969, man landed on the moon, a triumph of science, technology, and engineering. But on the weekend of August 15th, primitive man ran amuck in the mud of Woodstock in utter rejection of modernity. How could such divergent moments occur less than a month apart? While we look back at the Kennedy administration as Camelot, it only became Camelot retroactively after an interview Jackie Kennedy gave shortly after her husband's death. The phrase the Kennedy administration actually used was the new frontier, which is why it's probably not a coincidence that less than three years after Kennedy's death, a young television producer began his weekly show set in the ultimate hinterlands of the new frontier. Space, the final frontier. The boundless enthusiasm of America meant that it was always moving forward, even into outer space. Aesthetically, the look of America during that period was Helvetica, the crisp, modern, sans-serif typeface that represents order and rationality. I imagine there was a time when it just felt so good to take something that was old and dusty and homemade and crappy looking and replace it with Helvetica. Uh, you go to a corporate identity consultant circa 1965, 1966, and they would take that and lay it here and say, here's your current stationery and all it implies, and this is what we're proposing. And next to that, next to the belching smokestack and the nuptial script and the ivory paper, um, they'd have a crisp, bright white piece of paper and instead of amalgamated widget founded 1857, it just would say Widgeco in Helvetica medium. Can you imagine how bracing and thrilling that was? That must have seemed like you would, go, you would crawl through a desert with your mouth just caked with filthy dust, and then someone's offering you a clear, refreshing, distilled, icy glass of water. AMC's Mad Men series, set in the early 1960s, takes place, at least at the office, very much in a Helvetica world as does Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, which was released in 1968, but largely photographed two years earlier. It assumed that the world shaped by modern design would exist uninterrupted 35 years into the future. But the men who created the Helvetica world were rapidly dying off. 1969 saw the death of two key modern architects, Mies van der Rohe and Walter Gropius. Gropius founded the seminal Bauhaus School of Design in 1919, Mies van der Rohe was its last director when the Nazis ordered it closed in 1933. Mies's architecture in particular was the look of American cities in the 1950s and 1960s, as was an offshoot called Googie. Googie was a whimsical attempt to add curb appeal to modernism, and it's a design that we most associate with the original Golden Arches, along with numerous coffee houses. But even McDonald's saw the handwriting on the wall that year. In 1969, the company changed the design of its buildings from Googie-era modernism to a more traditional conservative design. And throughout the rest of the fast food world, Miesian flat roofs and Googie architecture were out, mansard-roofed traditionalism was in. 
Of course, it wasn't just commercial architecture that was experiencing a Back to the Future moment. By the early 1970s, the optimism and style of Kennedy's New Frontier was replaced by endless doom, pessimism, and the belief that the past was a better place than the New Frontier to come. In 1973, Patrick Moynihan said that, quote, most liberals had ended the 1960s rather ashamed of the beliefs that they had held at the beginning of the decade, unquote. The moon landings were a leftover appendage from the previous technology-driven optimism of American liberalism. Woodstock was the Big Bang, heralding the birth of a new liberal worldview, one that rejected science and rationality and replaced it with a falsely romantic return to primitivism. By the early 1970s, Hollywood science fiction portrayed future worlds filled with pollution, death, and overpopulation. Maybe that's why even George Lucas had to set Star Wars centuries ago in the past. Was the Death Star filled with Malthusian doomsday cultists obsessed with maintaining zero population growth throughout the Empire? One way or another? Are we in a similar period as the late 60s and early 70s? Well, the 1990s saw the rise of the World Wide Web, a graphical user-friendly interface built upon a computer network called the Internet that the Defense Department had originally begun in 1969. But in the final years of the noughts, much like the final years of the 1960s, the tension between modernism and primitivism continued unabated. And there's plenty of money to be made off both worldviews. F. Scott Fitzgerald famously said that, the test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in the mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. In 1969, Warner Brothers was happy to sponsor Woodstock, whose peace protest ultimately led to millions of Vietnamese losing their freedom, but put millions of dollars into Warner Brothers coffers via the documentary film and hit accompanying soundtrack. Today, Al Gore is happy to sit on the board of a company like Apple, which has brought creative freedom to millions, even as he wants to take away individual choice about how we live our lives. Meanwhile, rock star Dave Matthew travels around the world in planes, buses, and limos with tractor trailers hauling his band's gear, but feels free to tell the rest of us. I think people that don't move around as much as me can, can take a bike when it's a nice day and if, it's an if there's an opportunity or a walk or um, you know, turn off their lights and things like that. In that sense, to borrow the title of another Warner Brothers product, the song really does remain the same. For Silicon Graffiti, I'm Ed Driscoll.